we've been doing all week. We know that that's what God desires to give us. Amen. The rain. Amen. So, before we continue in our study of the Word of God, if we could kneel and solicit God's guidance and His blessing at this hour. It's so wherever possible if we can kneel for prayer, please. Every head is bowed, all eyes are closed. Father in heaven, more about Jesus we would know more of his grace to others show but if you do not pour out your Holy Spirit upon us Lord especially at this hour in Earth's history you've said that we should ask of you rain in the time of the latter rain and that you'll send bright clouds and give us showers of rain to each and every one grass in his field. Father, we really, really, Lord, need the infilling of Jesus. But we know in, in order to be infilled with Jesus we must first be emptied of self so as we come to you this morning we ask you to make us willing to be made willing to fall upon the rock Christ Jesus and in falling on the rock Christ Jesus that we will die you said that unless a grain of corn is thrown into the soil and it dies it will abide alone that living is given if we find our lives in this world we will lose them but if we lose our life in this world we will find it so as Jesus is your wisdom and your power and he comes to give us the power to lay down our life as he laid down his life and as he has power to lift his life up again so he will lift our lives up again in the by and by but for now we need to die so that you can fill us so draw nigh unto us O Lord reveal your glory the glory of self-sacrificing love this is the glory, the righteousness that Moses saw in the law. Your life of self-sacrifice and your death. That we may behold your glory this morning. And that we may fall down before you. Crying out, woe is me for I am undone. And that we may die. That our lives may be hidden with Christ in thee. This is our desire and our prayer. So draw nigh unto us now. And bless us, Father. Bless us with the revelation of Jesus Christ. That it, by beholding, we may be changed into your image, we pray. Thank you for hearing and for answering. And for the blessing of your presence. That all the children of God say, Amen. 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 Now I'm, I'm going to continue um, where we were yesterday. I'm going to recap first. Um, Recapitulation is good, is it not? Yes. To recap is good because repetition 
reinforces memory. Amen? So, yesterday, we begun with a reading from the book Acts of the Apostles, page 585, paragraph 1. The book Acts of the Apostles, 585, paragraph 1. And we read, In the Revelation, in what book? In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. How many books? All the books. So, all the books of the Bible meet and end in the Revelation. And what is it a revelation of? That's what the first verse tells us, isn't it? The revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a revelation of Jesus. Amen? It says, here is the complement of the book of Daniel. Complement means to bring to the full, to bring to perfection. So the book of Revelation brings to perfection the book of Daniel. Amen? One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. And then it says, the book that was sealed is not the revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel relating to the last days. The angel commanded, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Daniel 12, 4. So, we, yesterday we began going through the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, to see what was that portion of the book of Revelation that was sealed up. Amen? We then read from the book Last Day Events, LDE, Last Day Events 189, paragraph 1, where the servant of the Lord says, A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. So if she says that a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs, can there be anything greater than what we need than a revival? No, because it is the greatest yes, and most urgent of all our needs. What did we say a revival was? An awakening from spiritual death. Amen. But then she goes on in other places. She says, a revival and reformation. She says, you cannot have a revival without a re reformation. A revival is an awakening from the spiritual dead. And a reformation is... A complete change of thought and ideas. Amen? Mm -hmm. We then read Faith I Live by FLB, Faith I Live by 345, paragraph 3 and 4. And I'll, I'll not read all of it. I think we have some interference. If you, if you have, um, I forgot to remind you, but if you have mobile phones or any device that has, um, um, what's it 
call if it if it picks up the internet, switch off the internet. Yes, because you get an interference feedback. Thank you very much. Five, three, four, five, paragraph three and four. She, remember, we just read that the revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. Then in faith I live by three, four, five, paragraph three and four, it says, and I read, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. They will all be given such glimpses of the open gates of heaven that heart and mind will be impressed with the character that all must develop in order to realize the blessedness which is the reward of the pure in heart. The Lord will bless all who will seek humbly and meekly to understand that which is revealed in the revelation. This book contains so much that is large with immortality and full of glory that all who read and search it earnestly receive the blessing to those that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. So one of the words that she's, she's touching upon in this reading from Faith I Live By is the word blessing, blessedness, and blessed. Yes? Three times she mentioned that word already. Amen? She then says, one thing will be certain, one thing will be certainly, no, so one thing will be cert will certainly be understood from the study of Revelation that the connection between God and his people is close and decided. Let us give more time to the study of the Bible. We do not understand the word as we should. The book of Revelation opened with an injunction to us to understand the instruction that it contains. So she says, let us give more study let us give more time to the study of the Bible. She says, the Bible. And then she says, we do not understand the word as we should. The book of Revelation opens with the injunction. So she mentions, let us give more study to the Bible. And then she says, the book of Revelation. Because all the books of the Bible meet and end in the book of Revelation. Amen? She then says, when we understand what this book means to us, there will be seen among us a great revival. Yes? So a, re a revival is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. But then she brings the revival down to the book of Revelation because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. All the books of the Bible reveal Jesus, but the book of Revelation reveals him in such a way for the last church, because the book of Revelation is written for the last church, it reveals him in such a way because it reveals him to us in the sanctuary above and the work that he is doing. And we must not only understand this work, but we must partake in this work because it's a simultaneous work. As he's doing this work in the heavenly sanctuary, the Holy Spirit must be doing the same work within the earthly sanctuary, within our body temples. Amen? So to partake in this work and to be a part of this work, we must understand it. Amen? So then... There is um, the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel are one. One is the prophecy, one is the revelation. One is a book seal, the other book is a book open. And then we're told that there is a portion of the prophecy of Daniel which is sealed. Daniel is told, but thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. And I asked the question, when was the time of when is the time of the end? Eight, eight, 
Amen. The time of the end is the end of a time prophecy. So at the end of the at the end of 1798, it was the time of the end, the end of a time prophecy. And at the end of the 1335, it was the time of the end, the time of the end of a time prophecy. And then again at the end of the 2,300 days, 1844, it was the end of a time prophecy. And can I ask a question? Are we now in the time of the end? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Are we now in the time of the end? Yes, we are. We are in the time of the end. Because we were in 1989 and But remember, 1844, somebody could turn to you and say, but 1844. That was the end of all time prophecies. Time shall be no longer. Mm. Yes? Some could turn to us and say, yes? Yeah. But then we should turn around and respond. Yes, you're correct. That was the end of all time prophecies. But then, well, as you read it, the, the writings of Ellen White, she writes in a specific way. You don't just, we shouldn't just read the writings of Ellen White. We should study the writings of Ellen White. Amen? Because we're told in um, Isaiah 8 and 20, to the law and to the testimony. Yes? And her writings are the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yes, and we, we did that study the other day. Her writings are the testimony of Jesus Christ, the spirit of prophecy. Amen? So, most of those time prophecies I mentioned in between 1798 and 1844 and 1798 to 1844 as we have said yes is the time period where 1798 Elijah's returning how do we know Elijah's return in 1798 and we're going to look at some of this as we go along but how do we know Elijah's return in 1798? We've discussed this. No, God gives us a more sure word of prophecy why we should know Elijah's return in 1798. Triple of prophecy. And why we should know 1840 is not only, now hear the word that I'm using, 1840 is not only the fire falling on Elijah's altar at Mount Car Carmel which turns the children's hearts back to God God is our God but 1840 is also the baptism of Jesus Christ because now all of the books are meeting in the book of Revelation and then 1844 is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And we should, as students of prophecy, we should be able to demonstrate this from the Bible. Amen? Yeah. So then, when we, and as we go along, we'll, we'll, we'll open up as much as possible on these things. Yes? So, when we get to 1844, when time shall be no longer, if we say we're now living in the time of the end, let's say, but there's no more time prophecy. But the servant of the Lord, she says, she comes, she has statements like she says, um, she says um, that okay, time should be no longer after 1844. But then she says, um, with regards to the Millerite time period, which is 1798 to 1844, the time period you just mentioned, she says um, that. The first and second angel's message was given between 1798 and 1844. And she said, it was, she says, it was a figurative, so she said, it was under the first and second angel's message that their faith had to be tested. Yes? In accordance with God's wonderful, um, oh yes, wonderful and advanced truth. 1798 to 1844. And then time shall be no longer. And we're now under the proclamation of the third angel's message. She says, we can't have a third 
without the first and second. All three messages must be given again. So we have a message that's based according to time, and then the third angel's message, which is not based according to time. And then she said things like, the third angel's message is stronger than time. It doesn't need time. But then she says, the third angel's message is a figurative delineation of events which transpired under the first and second angel's messages. So the third angel's message is nothing but the first and second angel's message repeated without time. So now, so now, what we're looking for, we're looking for events. Events which transpired in time once before, but they're now transpiring without time. But it's still, um, it's still the time of the end. Because of these events transpiring, we know that it's the time of the end, but they're not working according to time. Amen? So when 1798 transpired, you had three players. You had Papal Rome having its deadly wound, and it had its deadly wound by France, atheism, and you had 1798, the United States of America rising to power. 1989, which is a repeat of that event, you have Papal Rome again, you have atheism in Russia, and America coming together with Rome to topple atheism. But as they come together, there's a biblical principle that wherever you see atheism, there's a change of heads taking place. A movement from one power to another. So in 1798, the papacy is going down, and atheism is there. And America, a change of heads. 1798, you have um, papacy. So, 1989, we have the papacy. Um, let me just, if we just bow our heads, I just wish to pray. Father God, I'd just like to say thank you for your Holy Spirit moving, prompt our hearts to seek you in prayer. As we've just had slight interference and a disturbance, Lord, we ask that you'll bring our minds back to your word and where we were following you, running to and fro. And continue to bless us, we pray. And help us not to lean upon our own understanding, but to lean upon your almighty arm. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, so, 1989, we have the papacy and America coming together to topple um, communism in Poland and the Soviet Union. Atheism always brings about a change of head. So 1989, as America, a Protestant nation who used to protest Rome, is joining with Rome, what is happening is that through the common enemy ploy, yes, atheism in Russia is an enemy for the papacy. It's an enemy because of the Iron Curtain. It keeps religion out. Amen? So, the papacy is trying to take control of the world. So it needs to knock the iron curtain down. Amen? But America is also an enemy of Rome. Why? Because it's a Protestant nation. And because... And because... 
and because America also there was some let's keep our minds in any places let's keep praying about this situation here we may have to change one One, two, can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. So, because, um, let's keep praying, brethren. Um, because the common enemy ploy, um, America comes together. Remember, Rome never has an army. Yes? Within Rome, Rome has the Swiss Guard. But with regards to an army needing to conquer other nations, Rome never has an army. So, 1989, the, the, the Berlin Wall falls, yes, and Catholicism floods Soviet Union again. But, 1989, America is seen, America is seen in 1989. Prior to 1989, there's two superpowers is the Soviet Union and the United States of America. Yes? After 1989, there's only the United States of America and the superpower. But the United States of America has been almost made a superpower by the virtue of the Catholic Church. And now, the woman, Revelation 17, the woman is now climbing back on a military power. So the woman is now, 1989, beginning to ride the beast again. Yes? Now in the past, when the woman is riding the beast, she gets that nation to solicit the other nations, to get the other nations to join her so she can ride on the back of all of them. So this is what's now transpiring. America is now America as the false prophet hear the language America as the false prophet is also the daughter Salome 1989 you know the party has begun you know everybody's now drinking wine and you know that Salome is now doing the dance of deception to get all the other kings to join her with the mother. So you know where this is going. At the end of this all, the mother will say, give me the head of John the Baptist. That's where this is going. Amen? Amen. So we began reading through Daniel chapter 12. So turn with me to Daniel chapter 12. Yes, go ahead. You said um, Ameri uh, the, pap the papacy made American superpower. Yes. It's by virtue. It's by virtue of the toppling of the Soviet Union. There were two superpowers. Mm -hmm. This is what 1989 and the Star Wars and everything was all about. Yeah. America, America <laughs> had its nuclear missiles trained on the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had its super its nuclear missiles trained on the United States of America and the West. And then America began to push the Star Wars program mm -hmm. to put satellites in space that could destroy the Soviet Union nuclear missiles, the ballistic missiles that were coming across. And while America was racing to put this satellite program in space, it put pressure on the Soviet Union to try and do the same. But while it was putting pressure on the Soviet Union to do the same, America, through the papacy, was funding um, Lech Wałęsa, who was also Polish, as the Pope was Polish, funding um, Lech Wałęsa to begin the movement Solidarity. And on the ground, Solidarity has been funded with equipment and, and funds through America, 
And as this movement on the ground was building up and building up, the, the um, Soviet Union could not fund uh, a, a satellite program and protect itself from within, from this movement that was transpiring. It was either one or the other. So as it tried to do both, it was weakened to the point that the, the solidarity movement, perestroika, the wave of wanting freedom pushed right throughout the Soviet Union and eventually we saw the symbol of the Soviet Union and the repression of the Soviet Union, the Berlin Wall topple. But in so doing this, in America going into this alliance with Rome, what's really happening is that the real enemy for papal Rome is the United States of America. So America giving up its former beliefs of Protestantism the cracks have now appeared in the Constitution, which is the second war, which is now falling. Amen. That's the real aim. Because 1798, when the papacy went down, who took the vacant seat? Who took over the world? America. America. So as 1989, when this history is repeating and all three players are seen again, the real enemy for Rome is the person who took her seat. America. But she wants to climb up on the back of America and use America as its army. America becomes the army of Rome. And now she's riding to take the other armies of the rest of the world. Because it's pointless to just have an America because she wants to control the whole world this time around. But America was already a superpower. It's just that you mean the put her on the throne as a superpower. Well, as of this moment in the world, before 1989 there were two superpowers. After 1989 there was only one superpower, the United States of America. Yes? Um, communism became so, it, it broke back up into all the, the United um, USSR, the United States of Soviet Russia, it broke up back into all countries again. It was no longer a United States so to speak, of Soviet Russia. Amen? Okay, so we were reading through Daniel chapter 12. And that's Daniel chapter 12. And I was just impressed. Um, um, the question which was asked was for the, this for the camera. The question which was asked was with regards to um, 1989 and America already being a superpower prior to 1989 with regards to it still being a superpower so I was just explaining with regards to what's now transpired also spiritually within the United States of America that it has become the power that um, Catholicism is now riding and will use to take control of the rest of the world Daniel chapter 12 we read from 1 to 4, and at the time of the end, sorry, and at that time, sorry, shall Michael stand up, Daniel 12 from verse 1, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such, a, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Verse 2, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that shall be wise shall turn, that shall, shall shine, sorry, as the brightness of the firmament. And they shall turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. And then here's the verse we read with regards to Acts of the Apostles 5.8.5. 5. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be, shall be, shall, shall be increased. So verse 4, Daniel is told to shut up the words and seal the book. So you, between 1 and 4, you can see nothing in there which is words of being shut up and sealed. Can you? So it's something prior to that, because verse 1 says, and at that time and what is shut up and sealed is verse 
40 to 45. And in verse 40, if we look at verse 40, Daniel 11, 40, it says, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push up him, colon, so at the time of the end of the time prophecy, 1798, shall the king of the south, the south symbolized atheism in ancient times, so it's, it's um, atheism in France. So at the time of the end of the time prophecy, 1798, shall atheism in France during the French Revelation push at him, the papacy, colon, there is a break, yes? And it's a break in time. Because after the colon is the papacy returning. And the king of the north, the papacy, shall come against him, atheism, but not in France. Because after 1798, the atheism of France went underground, the Jacobean movement went underground and re-emerged in Bolshevik Russia and caused the October Revolutions of 1917. And the revolution caused the Tsar and his family to fall. Yes? Catholicism is aware of this history. Yes? When the Tsar and his family fell, uh, uh, the, the large majority of the priests that were killing, killed in Russia were Catholics. Yes? So you have 1989 now. Catholicism is returning, but it's returning with an army, the United States of America. So we read, And the king of the north shall come against him, the Soviet Union, like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Communism is vanquished. Amen? Amen. So when we go back to Daniel 12, we, we read in Daniel chapter 12 from verse 6. No, we read from verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man, clothed in what? <laughs> Linen, which was upon the waters of the river. So you have one on this side of the bank of the river, the other on that side of the bank of the river, and one walking on the waters. Yes? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and he swear by him that liveth forever that it should be for a time, times and a half. A time prophecy is here mentioned. And when he should have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things should be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Now here's Daniel. I heard this, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So he's repeating verse 4, isn't it? Yes? But thou, o Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Yes? So the words are being repeated. Now, keep your finger in Daniel chapter 12. Yes? And we turn to Revelation 10. Keep your finger in Daniel chapter 12 and turn to Revelation 10. But the books of the Reve Daniel and Revelation are what? One. One. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 10, please. And if we don't finish this study this morning, don't worry because we will continue it later on. Yes, Revelation chapter what book? Revelation chapter 10. Yes? And if you hold it, amen? Yeah. Revelation chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, 
and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face were as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book, what? Opened. So in the book of Daniel, the book was seen. Here in the book of Revelation, the book is opened. But how do we know it's the same point in time which Daniel saw? Yes? He says, and he set his right foot upon the what? Sea. And his left foot upon the earth. earth. So we have one in Daniel, but one saint on one side, another saint on another side, and one walking on the waters. But here in the book of Revelation, this one that was walking on the waters is now stepping off the waters and he has one foot on the earth and one foot on the sea. Amen? And, and, and some biblical historians say it was Daniel that was on one side, John on the other side, and the angel in the linen in the middle is stepping across to the side where John is now standing. Yes? So this angel steps from off the waters onto the opposite side. And who is John playing the role of? John is playing the role of the church. How do we know this? Because he's told to take the book and eat it. It will be sweet in his mouth and bitter in his belly. Who had that experience? The Millerites, the church. Amen? So John is playing the role of the church. So when this angel is stepping from one side to the other side, he's coming to the church. Amen? And he cried with a loud voice, as when a, li when a lion roared, verse 3. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? We're told it wasn't the book of Revelation that was sealed, but it was the book of Daniel. Yes? But here in the book of Revelation, as this angel utters his voice, it says a lion roaring, seven thunders utter their voices. And John says, as he was about to write, he's told, seal up those things. Yes? But we're told it was not the book of Revelation we read from Acts of the Apostles 585. It was not the book of Revelation that was sealed, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel. But here we're told, John is told to seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. It was the same information in Daniel. It was the same information, yes. But why does the servant of the Lord say it was not the book of Daniel, it was not the book of Revelation that was sealed, but the book of Daniel. But here it says, as the angel is uttering these voices, he's told to seal up those things that the seven thunders uttered. If it wasn't the book of Revelation that was sealed, but the book of Daniel, why here does it say the angel was about, he was about to write what the angel said, and he was told to seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Isn't there a sealing then in the book of Revelation? Is there not a sealing in the book of Revelation? There is a sealing. In the, we just read it. There is a sealing in the book of Revelation also. Yes? But we're told in the book of Daniel, the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. Now don't get me wrong. If you're just getting into this stuff and you don't understand it, that doesn't mean you're wicked. Amen? Amen. Amen? But there is a class of people that because they hold iniquity in their hearts, yes? Like, like the Jews, yes? And this always, I always marvel at this, that Jesus deliberately stayed away from Lazarus when he knew Lazarus was ill. Deliberately stayed away from Lazarus for four days until Lazarus had died. And because of the climate, the part of the world in which they lived in, 
They didn't, unlike today, somebody can die and you can put them on refrigeration. You can have them for, for months before they're buried. And they can still open the coffin at the funeral. Yes? Yes? But in that climate, they didn't have refrigeration. So when somebody died, you had to bury them immediately. Yes? And, 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 and Mary, Mary and Martha said it. When he said, roll away the stone, they said, by now, Lord, he's stinking. He's decomposing. He's decaying. Yes? So Jesus waited four days so that Lazarus would not only be dead, but be decomposing. And told them, and there were scribes and Pharisees in the crowd watching all this. And he said, roll away the stone. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out. And later on in the Bible, you hear this discussion between the scribes and the Pharisees. They said, of a truth, a notable miracle has been done here. But lest the people believe, when Jesus said Lazarus is home, the scribes and the Pharisees decided that not only would they kill Jesus, but they had to kill Lazarus also. Because people were believing on Jesus because Lazarus is now awake. Yes? Iniquity in the heart. Knowing the power of God and yet still denying it. Yes? And there was a class of people in this time who they can see how the books of Daniel and Revelation are linking. They can understand what's being said with regards to the charts and the 2520 and all this information. They can understand it and yet they still deny it. Yes? The 2520 is not a time prophecy. Yes? But then I, I've always said, how do you make seven fat core, seven fat ears of corn and seven thin ears of corn and seven fat cows and seven thin cows. How does that become a prophecy? But it was. Amen? So, the book is sealed up to those who in their hearts desire not to know. Yes? Revelation 4 and 5, Jesus takes the book and begins to remove the seven seals and it's understanding coming into the minds of the Millerites. And his understanding come into our minds. And under the seventh church, he removes the seventh, seal, the seventh seal. And seven angels with seven trumpets begin to blast. Seven, seven, seven. Complete perfection, complete sealing. Yes? The seal placed upon them, the minds of the Millerites, because they're a type of 144,000. The Father's name, his character, fully perfected in them. And what was the Millerite church called? Philadelphia, what does Philadelphia mean? Brotherly love. Brotherly love. And what have we been speaking about here? The glory of God is self-sacrificing love. Fully perfected in the Millerites, which must be fully perfected in the last church. Amen? That you should desire to lay down your life for your friend Jesus and for your, isn't this the law? To love God with all your heart and to love your fellow men. You should lay down your life for God and lay down your life for your fellow men. Amen. Is this not where we've been brought to? Yes. That you can love your enemy? Yes. Amen? Amen? So, here we see this sealing take place. Yes? If we go to verse 5, verse 5 of Revelation 10. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him. Have you seen this language before somewhere? Did we not just read this in Daniel chapter 12? The angel who was on the waters lifted up his hand, his left hand and his right hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever, that it should be for a time, times and a half. Here he says, and the angel which I saw upon the water, upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created the heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things that therein are, that there should be time no longer. So in Daniel chapter 12, it was that it should be for a time, times and a half. 
And we know that the serpent law, she says, 1798 is a type of the end of the world. What happened in the French Revolution is a type for the end of the world. And then she says, 1844 is a type for the end of the world. But then she says, the destruction of Jerusalem is a type for the end of the world. Because all these three events are one. It's the same event. Yes? So when he says, times, times and a half, that's the end of the French Revolution. And when he says that there should be time no longer, that's 1844, which is also a type. And it's only when you take the platform of the Millerites, which ends in 1844, and you take the platform of the papacy, it's rise, and when it comes to the end, and you lay these two platforms on top of one another like a sandwich, that you realize all the events are the same. Amen? And, and this is what we're doing. Amen? Amen? Okay, if you turn me back to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. You read Daniel in verse 6. Daniel said, I heard but I understood not. Yes? Which we've read. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be to the end of these things? Now turn me to verse 11. Because he still doesn't understand. So the, the angel is now trying to explain what he said to him about the time, times and a half. To explain it, he uses two more time prophecies to explain it to him. Yes? Verse 11. And from the time that the daily, the word sacrifice is italicized. So it's a supplied word. And from the time that the daily shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Yes? Both of these time periods are mentioned on the charts. Yes? One, two, nine, zero. One, three, three, five. I can see over there on the peg of, peg of Rome, yes? So, it says, and from the time that the daily shall be taken away, What's the time? What was the daily, first and foremost? Yes. Back then, back then when, when medieval papal Rome was rising, what was the daily? Paganism. Paganism. But what aspect of paganism? The three horns. The three horns. Daniel chapter 7 brings to view the fourth beast. He has ten horns. Yes? And we see that's pagan Rome breaks up into the ten divisions of Western Europe. And then we see another little horn with eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great thing. Papal Rome is rising. The empire, the, the empire of, of um, pagan Rome, the, the, the emperor moves the seat from Rome to Constantinople. 330, yes. The year 330 AD. And when he moves the seat, um, the, empire, the empire of pagan Rome is left vacant and the church begins to take over. But the church inherits the grief that pagan Rome was having. Its grief was it was being attacked by the barbarian nation, the ten barbarian nations. Papal Rome takes over the seat and it inherits the grief. So it needs a champion. Clovis of France, a, a barbarian also, an Aryan in belief, yes? He gives his military might to the church. And in giving his military might to the church, he begins to persuade the other barbarian nations to give their military might to the church. Out of the ten, six others join him. So seven of them are now Catholic. Three refuse to give their military might to the Catholic Church. They want to remain barbarians. The Vandals, the Heraline, the Ostrogoth. So now the church has an army. And she marches against the three horns that refuse to yield. And Daniel 7 says they are plucked up by the roots. The Vandals, the Heraline, the Ostrogoth. Amen? 
So the daily is taken away. But when did it begin to be taken away? And from the time that the daily shall be taken away. When did it begin to be taken away? 508. 508. Why 508? Why does God say, and from the time that the daily is taken away? No. 508 was the moment that Clovis decided to become Catholic. Yes? 508. The moment Clovis decided to become Catholic, as far as God is concerned, and take us down, Proverbs 23, 6 and 7, Proverbs 23, 6 and 7, and Matthew 5, 27 and 28. And Proverbs 23, 6 and 7 says, um, Eat thou not the bread of him that has an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meat. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. The moment that Clovis thought in his heart to become Catholic, yes? Matthew, 20, Matthew 5, 27 and 28 says, Ye have heard that it is, was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, That whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, Has committed adultery with her already in his heart. For God, it's not the outward action. It's, we're judged by what we think, what we're doing in our minds. Yes? That's how God is judging us. We're not even supposed to be thinking evil when this finishes. Amen? So, because Clovis, when Clovis decided to give his military mic to Rome, God says, and from the time that the day, yes, shall be taken away, even though it took another 30 years to remove the free horn, from the moment, 508, God says it's taken away. Amen? You follow? Yes. Is that, that's, that prophecy from 508 to 538 is where Satan is on the field of Christ at 30 years to prepare no. before he starts his ministry? 508 to 538. Say that again, sorry. 508 to 538. He gave the papers for 30 years before he's coming to Yes. Yes. And it take Christ 30 years. Yes. 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 508 to 538. It took the pagan Rome 30 years to remove his three horns. And the brother was just bringing out a parallel that. So it took Christ from the age zero to 30 before he became the Messiah. So yes, the papacy is counterfeiting the thing of God says. Yes? Okay. So then we get to verse 12. And this is where our focus is for this study. Verse 12. Blessed is he that waited and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. Yes? Let me just go backtrack. Verse 11. So 508, when you add the, um, it says, and from the time that daily shall be taken away and the abomination that make of desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety and ninety days. A thousand two hundred and ninety years, a day for a year, added to 508, brings you to 1798. So God is bringing you to the time when we just mentioned with regards to Papal Rome's fall because of atheism in France and America's rights. He's bringing you to that point in time. Yes? And he's bringing you to that point in time to answer the question which was asked with regards to how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And the man in linen on the waters who raised his hand, he says, um, Um, and it shall be for a time, times and a half. For when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Yes? He's answering this question with two more time prophecies. So we just looked at one in Daniel 12, 11. We're looking at the second one in Daniel 12, 12. Blessed, however, is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand 
305 and 30 days. So there's a blessing pronounced. Yes? Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,300 and 1,305 and 30 days. Okay. So, what is this blessing? Yes? And what is this time period? You take the same starting point, 508, and you had 1335 years, and it brings you to 1843, a date which is also mentioned on the chart, but also this is called the 1843 chart. Yes? Now remember, we read earlier on from Faith I Live By with regards to. We read with regards to our greatest need is a revival. And then we read, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have a totally different experience. And then he spoke about all will realize the blessedness and will receive the blessing. Amen? Mm -hmm. What is this blessing? The presence of God. Yes? And we discussed that the other day as well. That when God created Adam and Eve, he said he blessed the couple. And then when he created the Sabbath, he blessed the day. And I asked the question, is the blessing of the man and the blessing of the day any different? And he all said no. And we asked the question, what makes something blessed? And we came to the conclusion, it's the presence of God that makes something blessed. So when those who are blessed, who wait and come to this time, 1843, they are blessed. Amen. So what is the blessing they, 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 they receive at that point in time? It's the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. The presence of the Lord. Yes. So how do we know it's the presence of the Lord? How do we know it's the presence of the Lord? Because they're prepared for Christ's coming. Because they've prepared for Christ's coming. They've prepared for Christ's coming. That's true. That is true. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. We'll just read this and we'll go around up here, but we will continue. So turn with me to Galatians chapter 3, please. Galatians, book of Galatians, chapter 3. What book did I say? Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Are we found? Can we say amen? Okay, Galatians chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 6 to 9. Galatians chapter 3. Reading from verse 6 to 9. Even as Abraham believed God. What did Abraham do? Believed God. And it was accounted unto him for what? Righteousness. For righteousness. Yes? Have we been looking at righteousness this week? Yes. Yes? We've been looking, we read a statement, and Aaron had a statement up on the board where the servant of the Lord, she says, she says, the glory, and this is where our focus has been, the glory of God. Why has our focus been on the glory of God? Because the first angel's message says, fear God and give glory to Him. And we all agree that the angel of Revelation 18 coming down is the latter rain, isn't it? Is it not? Yes. yes? But when the angel of Revelation 18 comes down, what does Revelation 18 one say? And the earth was filled with glory. And I saw another angel coming down and the whole earth was lightened with his glory. Yes? The whole earth will be lightened with the glory of God. The first angel's message is fear God and give glory to him. Yes? And when the angel of 18 comes down, power comes into the earth. And the whole earth is lightened with his glory. Amen? 
And then when you read on in Revelation 14, it says Babylon is fallen. And when you read on in Revelation 18, it says Babylon is fallen. It's the same message. Yes? So, the whole earth is to be lightened with the glory of God. But we've read statements where Sister White says, let me ask you a question. The glory of God, which was upon Moses' face when he looked into the law, yes? Is it any different from the glory of God in the first thing? First angel's message. And is it any different from the glory of God which lightens the whole earth with the glory of God under Revelation 18? But when God speaks about Revelation 18, he says, I will rain down righteousness upon you. Yes? He's going to rain down righteousness upon us. He says, My doctrine shall fall as rain. So it's, it's a doctrine which brings righteousness to the hearts of the people. Amen? And yet here in Galatians 3 verse 6 it says Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Can we say this is believing? Can we say believing has anything to do with faith? Yes. So would you say this is Righteousness by faith has been spoken about because Abraham is the father of righteousness, isn't he? I mean, the father of faith. But it was his righteousness. Righteousness, we said, is what? Right doing. What did Abraham do which was so right? He offered up his son. Yes? And God had promised him, In thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Is that blessing any different from the blessing we've read about in Daniel chapter 12, 12? Blessed is he that wait from coming to the 13, 35. Is that blessing any different? Is that blessing any different from the blessed man who was created in Eden and the day that God blessed? Is the blessing any different? No. What makes something blessed? The presence of God. Amen? So when we come to Galatians, it says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are <coughs> of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be what? Yes. Be blessed. Yes? Verse 9. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Amen? Amen? Jump down to 14, verse 14 of the same chapter. It says, That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that they might receive the promise of the spirit through faith amen? amen now the promise of the spirit is the blessing amen? amen the promise of the spirit is the blessing but when the Holy Spirit comes does he come to speak of himself he comes to speak of Jesus Christ That's, this is what Jesus was speaking about in John 14 15 and 16 the comforter coming but he also says when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you to all truth. He will not speak of himself. Yes? He will take of mine and shall show it unto me. And he shall glorify me. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. He comes to bless, but he comes to glorify Christ in the person. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that you are not your own? Therefore, glorify God in your body. Is this glory any different to the glory that Moses saw in the law? We read that the glory that Moses saw in the law, that the law has no glory apart from Christ revealed in the law. The righteousness of Christ in the law is the glory of the law. Moses saw the life and the self-sacrificing nature and death of Christ in the law. He saw this when he looked at the lambs. All that God was showing him, he saw Christ. And as he saw Christ, he was enwrapped and glory would fill his face. Yes? Now here we're seeing that the blessing of Abraham is righteousness. 
God will rain down righteousness upon us. This righteousness is what we've been speaking about. The glory of God. Self-sacrificing love. And those who, blessed is he that waited for coming to the 1335, when the Millerites reached 1843, and they understood all this to mean, to, to, they saw Christ in all of this, in this chart, they saw Christ. And when they beheld Christ in the law, the blessing of Abraham was upon them. They saw what righteousness was right doing. And they were, they, the fullness of Christ was in them. Those who came to 1843, the fullness of Christ was in them who understood. Yes? They could now wait. They had the patience to wait because Righteousness is what the fruits of the Spirit are. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is patience. So when 1844 now came, and the disappointment, the crucifixion, the foolish were told, because they said they couldn't understand the prophecy, they were piggybacking on the experience, they were moved by a flickering light of good emotions. They were piggybacking on the experience of those who had studied. So when they saw Christ didn't come in 1844, we're told they cut the knot of difficulty. Ah, we knew you were deluded. We knew Christ wasn't really coming. But those who had this experience and the blessedness had come upon them, the presence of the Lord, the righteousness had been rained down on them, Jesus Christ, they said, although we don't know, we can't understand what has transpired here, we know that the Lord has led us step by step. So we're going to hold on until God gives us more light, more understanding. And then, as the disciples lost their Lord when he was crucified, yes, and they found him again, so the Millerites, Sister White uses that same experience in the garden, where is his body? Show me where his body is. She uses that experience to describe the Millerites' experience. They lost their Lord. And they were crying. And then as they were walking through the cornfield, they discovered their Lord again. Where? In the sanctuary on high, moving from the holy to the most holy. Yes? We have come to that place where God is raining down righteousness in the doctrine that will distill us dew and rain. Amen? But we must now appropriate this understanding and we, it must become, well, as we eat this hidden manna, this bread, yes, when we're eating for strength. We shouldn't be eating for drunkenness so that we can understand all of this and we can give great swelling talks and show the knowledge we have. Because what does knowledge do? Puff. Knowledge puffeth up. Knowledge without Christ and I said this earlier in the week, Satan is constantly seeking. In Eden, he separated knowledge from Christ. Yes? He separated knowledge from Christ. And individuals say, we don't need prophecy. We need prophecy, brethren. Amen. We need Amen. prophecy. Amen. Yes? The angels in heaven, they, they were made perfect. They understood what love was to a great degree. But they didn't understand how the mystery of iniquity marched. And they were taken out of heaven, one third of them. Adam and Eve made perfect in the Garden of Eden. But they didn't understand how the mystery of iniquity marched. This is what God was revealing to them and he was teaching them. But Satan comes to the garden and said, listen, God's hiding knowledge from you. Let me give you a crash course in iniquity. You don't want to know it by just knowledge. Here, experience iniquity. And Adam and Eve were taken out. Daniel and Revelation, the prophecies, are designed to show you how the mystery of iniquity is marching. But the time period of Christ, yes, iniquity had turned into the scribes and Pharisees. It had on a garb of righteousness. The disciples couldn't see it through the prophets and through the testimony of the Father. They couldn't see it. So Jesus had to come and demonstrate it when the same scribes and Pharisees put Christ on the cross, the disciples realized 
Here's the dragon's hiding place in the scribes and Pharisees. You have crucified the Lord of glory. Amen? Amen. And prophecy shown us how paganism, Babylon, transformed itself into, into media Persia, into Greece, into Rome. Then it puts some Christian garments into papal Rome. And then it turns into, after 1790, it turns into Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother. It turns into the daughters. But does it cease its march there? No. no. It becomes the foolish virgins, apostate Adventism. And God wants you to understand this march. Because when they turn around at the end of this all, to crucify us. Yes? Sister White says, the scenes of the crucifixion have been. That's literally before the cross in a literal place. But after the cross, everything becomes spiritual and worldwide. So she says, what she's constantly using these principles in her writing. So she says, the scenes of the crucifixion have been and will be reenacted on an immense scale globally. <coughs> There's only two global churches. Catholicism, which is Babylon, is global. And Israel, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is global. So the crucifixion now has to be on a global scale. When those who understand these truths and righteousness has rained on them, on them and they grow up into Christ, when those who have iniquity in their hearts, the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand. When they build their altar and the fire doesn't come on their altar and they have the mark of Cain, Sunday, and those who do build the correct altar, and the, and the fire falls on their altar, remember what we read during the week? The altar is Christ. And the fire is the Holy Spirit. And if you are out against your brother, leave your gift at the altar. Because the altar is Christ. Self-sacrificing love. And if you don't love your brother, or your brother doesn't love you, then when you come to the altar, you must be the living sacrifice that's placed upon the altar. But you've got blemishes and spots and wrinkles because you don't love your brother. Leave your gift. Go and make it right with your brother. That when you offer yourself, God sees upon the altar self-sacrifice and love. Amen? Is this not what we've been discussing all week? Righteousness cannot rain down. The fire cannot come down upon a gift which has blemishes on it and spots. I've got something in my heart against you. But I don't leave my gift of love and come to you and say, No, brother, listen, I felt that you felt this way towards me. And you say, No, brother, that's a mistake. Such and such, such and such. And we pray about this. And when I come and offer my gift, God accepts the gift now. Is this not what we've been discussing all week and coming to this point with regards to the blessedness? This is the blessedness that God wants you to understand. Self sacrificing love. If these charts don't bring you to Christ, where you can now lay down your life, then knowledge will puff you up. Amen? Amen. And we will continue with this thought. Amen? Amen. If we can kneel for prayer, please. Divine, merciful, Heavenly Father. As we bow before you, Lord, in our nothingness, in our weakness, Lord, all of our righteousness, <coughs> all of our right doing, Lord, is filthy right. There is nothing we can do of ourselves. If you do not move upon our hearts and impress us, Lord, then everything is self-righteousness. And you said, except our righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, we must have the, the righteousness and the faith of Abraham. We must believe that you will provide us the land. 
you will provide the lamb for this offering. As Abraham was going to offer up his son, and he saw a ram caught in the thicket by its, or its horn, so you will provide us with the righteousness, even the righteousness of your son Jesus Christ, to clothe our nakedness. Oh Lord, please, that as you are investigating in these final moments of the judgment, that we will not be found to be the man in the wedding wearing his own garments. But Lord, we, that we'll allow you to divest us of all of our own righteousness. Take off our apron, our fig leaf apron, Lord. Make us willing to take this off, that you may put upon us coats of skin, even the flesh of Jesus Christ. And Lord, that we will be found worthy because of accepting your offering upon the Calvary's tree, Jesus and his righteousness, that we will be found worthy to follow you, Lord, into the marriage. And that as you and the church on earth become one, in exactly the same way that Pentecost transpired, Lord, that is what's transpiring now that we will be found worthy to be guests in this marriage. And that your prayer, that as you and the Father are one, that you and those who are left on earth may become one. That we, the last church, will become one with you in this work of washing and ironing and cleansing. That we may come into the marriage and bring the righteousness of the saints. That the church may be clothed, Lord, all dressed in white, that the bride may be ready, Lord, because of the work that is being done within each and every one of us in our hearts at this moment in time. So as you cause the light to shine into the darkness of our hearts and the light of your glory is being revealed, help us to be humble, Lord. As Isaiah saw your glory and said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Oh Lord, that we will be humbled. That we will not have a stony heart like fear, oh Lord. For you raised him up for your glory. But Lord, that we will be raised up for your glory. That we will be humbled, Lord. And that we will glorify you in the earth. That your glory will shine right throughout this earth. And that we will be like John that we will usher in your glorious coming as your forerunners. Thank you, Father, for all the light that you've allowed to shine into our lives. Thank you for all that you desire to do in us. Help us to partake in this work, Father. Please, that we will not hear at the end of this wedding, when the summer is past, when the harvest is ended, that we will not hear the words, I know you not, knocking on the outside of the door. Help us, Lord, because we cannot do this without you. I thank you for your presence here. I thank you for your Holy Spirit moving upon our hearts, even at this moment in time. Help us to yield our whole hearts to you. In Jesus' name.